Hello, looks like we have another digital Sunday. Meeting digitally this Sunday. I can't wait until we can get back together in the trail teens room. I miss you guys a ton. Um, one of the things that we're doing though, that we're trying to do is we're gonna to try to meet with the youth group on Zoom. And what Zoom is, Zoom is a digital meeting software where you could use the camera and the, and the microphone on your computers or on your phone and we could talk uh, videoally back and forth to each other. So we're, we're looking to do that. There's a couple things that you need to do before we can actually do that. The first thing is you got to get a permission slip from your parents. And I know we got some permission slips out there for like the podcast and stuff. But um, this is kind of a special thing, meeting videoally. So we, we really had to add that into the permission slip. So if, if you can, I will provide a link to that permission slip. Um, I will provide it uh, in our Google group or on Facebook Teens page, the Teens for Truth on Facebook. Um, so I'll get you guys those links, or you could even text me, um, and and you could text me, and I will send you the link over text. But um, we need to get those permission slips. The second thing you need is you need to download it to your phone, or uh, follow it on your web browser or whatever on your computer. So those are the things that um, to, in order to do this, and we're trying to do it by this Wednesday, um, and it'll be at 6:30 p.m. Just like if we were. Um, doing our normal youth group meeting so um, we're trying to do that we're trying to get it together um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of bugs to work out but it'll be worth our time all right before we get into the message let's pray dear Heavenly Father as we open up your word um, and we see what you'd have us to learn about what you've done and about your words about what you've done please let it reach our minds our souls and our spirit as far as um, how it affects us and how we live the rest of our life through this uh, that you've given us today. We ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, have you guys ever have you guys ever lived through something or, or noticed something and um, as you were as you were in the moment you didn't realize the significance of it you knew that it was significant but you didn't realize how significant it was um, I look back there's been several things in my life that have done that you know the significance of everything in that was huge and I didn't realize what the significance was in that situation well um, one that really stands out was when I was in the Coast Guard we used to patrol what they call the EEZ line and what that is the economic zone between Russia and United States and what we did is we kept Russian boats from coming into the United States and fishing on our side of the of the EEZ line well um, as we were doing this uh, I'll never forget one of the boats that we uh, we patrolled we found one of the boats that was on the other side of the EEZ line and it didn't seem like it was fishing or anything it was just a drift and it was Russian for sure and so we sent over a boarding party and found out real quickly that they couldn't move their engines were shot and the um, they had a fire in one of their processing rooms and so it, we found it kind of funny, you know, because it was a brand new boat. When we got on board that thing, it was brand spanking new. Um, it was so new, even where the, the nets, where they pull the nets up on the back, wasn't rusty. If you, if you ever watch any of those fishing shows, you'll, you'll notice all the boats, where the nets go or where the pots go. It's always, all the paint's been rubbed off and it's rusty there. This wasn't even rusty yet, so it was brand spanking new. So to, for it to be broken down was kind of strange. But, uh... We went on there, we did this, the captain told me to go down with a group. Um, there was a group of us mechanics that went down and were checking out why the engines weren't working. Um, we opened up the oil filter, which is a huge 55 gallon oil filter. And we opened it up and I looked down in there and somebody had stuffed mattresses in the oil filter to keep the engine from getting oil so it seized up. And all three engines were like this. And we were we were flabbergasted what in the world why would anybody do this to a ship that they're out in the ocean um in the bering sea mind you and it was rough it was it was i don't remember what month it was but it was rough and um put themselves in danger what would cause somebody to actually do that um there were only a couple things that we could think of 
first somebody was sabotaging the ship from within you know a single person um, for some reason we, we could never guess why or everybody on that ship was um, sabotaging the ship for, for a reason and um, so we brought it to the captain's attention of course and he did a kind of a mock little investigation trial thing and he said we can't figure it out we don't know why um, those got in there and how they got in there and we we couldn't imagine somebody putting them in there so um, the choice was made through a bunch of diplomatic resources and stuff stuff that was beyond my pay grade that we tow this ship back into Kodiak Alaska which really wasn't much fun because it would take us like two weeks under tow in heavy seas going really slow getting beat up by the ocean so that's all of us on the on the store it's all of us on the coast guard cutter we're like uh um but at the same time we knew that there was something significant about this this is something that doesn't just happen right this isn't something that happens every day um you don't tow russian trawlers into an american port every day you don't go across the whole bering sea um in 20 foot waves at times um just for something that was insignificant so as we're doing this i'm sitting there thinking what the world's going on this is kind of strange as much as a 21 year old really cares about that kind of stuff and uh we got into port and as we're pulling into port um the the there was a small boat coming out one of the coast guard small boats and on it were several agents and they of course went straight up to the captain and they were talking in the stateroom and all of a sudden, um, I was I was on throttle watch because as you're going in port, they tell you you know you're on throttle watch. We get a, a call down to the and said, hey, uh, go ahead. We're shutting the engines down. We're going to anchor out here in the bay. And mind you, my house is in Kodiak, Alaska, and we're anchoring in the bay of Kodiak. And we've been out to sea for 45 days, and I'm sitting there looking at where my house is, going, are you kidding? I'm going to sit here when I could be at home after all that time out to sea and uh sure enough that's what we were doing um but you know when you sign up in the military you that's what you do you do what they say and uh and you know that going in that's what preserves freedom so we're sitting out there and then the captain of course everybody's getting messed up over it right they're they're, they could sit there and look at their houses some people had families over there haven't seen their kids for 45 days and uh, they're getting, you know, a little upset, of course. Uh, but of course, we're in the Coast Guard too, and they understand that, that that's what they signed up for, even though it's still hard though, right? So um, the captain comes down and says, hey guys, this is really a significant moment. He said, I can't give you all the details, but we can't tie up to the dock. And uh, we're like, well, oh, okay. He said, the reason we can't tie up to the dock is because the sister ship to this one just got towed in last week and it got tied up to the dock and all of the crew got off the ship and ran into town all the crew from the the russian ship ran off and, and ran into town and were trying to claim immunity trying to become american citizens um, trying to say that they were from a tyrannical government and they wanted out so we couldn't do that um with this one because of all the political things that were going on and so here we are we're thinking man our freedom's gone um, we're sitting out here my kids are right over there matter of fact some of them some of the parents their kids were out on they could see them out there and they could look at them with the binoculars and um, and they were coming down seeing the ship out there because they knew what ship their dad was on and oh it was just it's hard and it wasn't very long it was like two days but still two days is hard after being out for 45 so we all knew something was significant about it we kind of played it off we didn't really understand um but we uh two years after that we would figure out what was significant about it in a, in a real hard way um two years later we were invited to go to petropavlovsk in the kamchatka um, peninsula and it's the biggest cold water port for russia and um there weren't any english-speaking people since world war one in that in that area which is really weird english speaking uh natural english naturally born english speaking people 
um, which was really kind of strange. And uh, so we went in there on a goodwill mission. Um, we had a sister ship that we followed in, their Coast Guard that, that was, did the same thing that we did, and we followed them in. But um, one of the things that we did bring is we had 5,000 Bibles on board, written in Russia, and we had oranges. Um, uh, cases and cases, I remember, because I helped load the cases of oranges. But um, we got there, and we tied up, and then the next day we were allowed people to come on and tour our ship, and then we would be able to go and go into town. And um, so the first day was kind of strange because we were just trading across the ships because you tie up the ships next to each other so that we were trading. The Russians were trading all sorts of valuable stuff for Levi's. And so we were like, man, I should have brought more Levi's. But we were giving them and we were taking home really cool stuff from Russia. Um, but the next day was really telling. And the next day was telling why it was so significant that these people would sabotage their boat. And I, I never even realized that. It took me two years before I realized it. And um, so the next day, there were thousands of people down there at the docks to see the Americans. Thousands. I mean, thousands. Petropavlovsk is bigger than Portland. And I would bet, to, I, would, I would venture to say that um, man, it was it was like having uh, the Rose Parade, except for even bigger than that. It, it was crazy. It was absolutely nuts. There were TV cameras there and everything else. I was in my uniform, my um, my uh, uh, dress uniform, and I had liberty. I, I'd saved up my liberty, so I had three days of liberty to go in and check out Russia. And as I was there, uh, it struck me why that was so significant that day that we were we were moored out there and i went into town and as i was getting off the boat there were mothers there with their daughters that were our age and they were trying to get us to take interest in their daughters because they wanted us if we took interest and maybe married them then we'd pull them out of that mess um another thing that struck me really weird was um the fact that that there was um so much so many people there that were so hopeless. They, they just had no hope at all. Um, we had a interpreter and she, she never spoke English to an English speaking person. She just learned it in school. So that's why she became our interpreter. She came up to us and said, hey, I wanna speak English to people that actually speak this uh, as their native language. And uh, so she took us all around and, and just you guys, the absolute, um, hopelessness that was in that area was just beyond control people were standing in line to get bread I mean, I mean it was five blocks long and uh, she told us all about it and anyhow what really set it in for me was the significance of all this is when we we traded all of our dollars I traded like $35 to make Russian rubles and I couldn't spend it all I, I mean and I tried I, I, I bought Re, uh, the whole restaurant in one restaurant I bought everybody in there um, food the plate and I it was it cost me like four bucks and everybody thought I was a big spender I, I thought that was cool but um, there was a lot of travesty really when you look back on it but at the end the the all the guys that this interpreter she was interpreting for all the guys pulled our money together because we only needed a little bit of ruples for you know just for uh, souvenirs and we gave it to her and she broke down and started crying and said that we paid for the rest of her college and her living expenses as she was going to college and that was three years just by doing that so the perspective and, and the significance of why somebody would do that was lost on me that day it was um the, the the ship floating around out there with guys that wanted to get to somewhere that was that much better it was so significant it was so significant that nobody else understood it we didn't understand it but it was so um earth shattering cha uh, a change for me in the way that i saw things after that that um i didn't even realize what the significant was significance was and today when we look at our passage which is in Acts 1 when we look at our passage um, we're gonna do the first nine chapters and this is during the ascension of Jesus Christ um, there were people there that that were witnessing this and they'd witnessed what was going on and they witnessed the the ministry of Jesus on earth 
and they lost the, they didn't have just like me they didn't know the significance of what really was taking place in front of their eyes um, as you guys probably know uh, to finish my story as you guys probably know uh, the Russian economy was just in a tank and that's when they say that um, communism was gonna fall in Russia um, it, the verdict's still out on that one but the fact of the matter was is there was something very significant going on there and for some reason humans don't understand the significance of things and um, and it was huge it was a huge huge thing well take that little anecdotal story and then apply that to what's going on with Jesus's earthly ministry and then the burial the resurrection and the ascension and then multiply it by five billion because um, the matter of fact is the whole all of eternity is actually been placed in this moment of um, this this is the action and the will of God um, made made uh, a, appeared in front of these guys and and how history and how eternity and how the future and all that stuff is going to hinge on this very moment of, of the resurrection the cross the resurrection and the ascension and people just didn't understand it and they didn't get it and I, I'm telling you man it's it's amazing to me um, even as we read it today, even with the hindsight that we have of thousands of years, we still don't understand it completely. Um, it, it, I really would like to try. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, really that's, I think, what the Lord really wants from us is that we, try, that we believe him enough to really go, wow, that's a big deal. I don't completely understand it, Lord, but I trust you in it. And I think there's so much more glory there that I'm going to give to you, even though I don't understand the glory. So let's take a look at it. Um, First thing is, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll read through and then I'll come back and talk about it a little bit. Uh, okay, so Acts 1, 1 through 9. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to, to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, while he was eating with them, that's cool to me, I, I will touch on that in a minute. While he was eating with them, he gave them this commandment, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father has promised you, for which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's huge, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, verse 6. Then, he gathered, uh, then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit that comes on you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. Boom! He was taken up before their very eyes, and, and the cloud hid him from their sight. So he went through the clouds. Um, we got some clouds out here today. They're kind of thin, but I could imagine what it would be like. They're, they're higher. I could imagine what it'd be like when you just watch Jesus go completely through the clouds. They were looking up, so they're still looking like, whoa, what the heck happened? They're looking up intently up into the sky as he, was going, as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white just appeared behind him, beside him. Boom! Just were right there. And men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. All right, let's let's take a look at this. Let's uh, break it down just a little bit. Um, pretty pretty amazing. It's a it's an amazing event. It's something that really happened, um, and it would be mind blowing. And, you know, we read this stuff and we look at it and we go, man, you know that's cool, and we kind of 
we kind of read it like it's a fairy tale I, I mean quite honestly but you got to understand try to put yourself into the disciples um, world that they there were they just imagine all of the stuff they they had gone through before this had happened um, they went through Jesus at the Passover meal at the Last Supper they went through that week they went through Good Friday watched him be nailed up on a cross watched him go into a grave watched him come out of a grave could you imagine what kind of I mean we talk about PTSD today could you imagine and they come out and then they're looking at this and then all of us not to let him off the hook all of a sudden the the two people dressed in or he he takes off into th through the clouds so far through the clouds that they can't they lost sight of him through the clouds and then two people in white show up next to him put yourself there because you really can't understand that until you do you really can't understand what's being said here until you do let's take a look um one of the things that you got to understand is the first the first verse i love the fact that luke actually put this in his gospel and he put it in the book of acts luke is the one that wrote both the gospel of luke and acts and um i, I think it's awesome because he actually put in here in my former book theopolis in other words he's saying this is what happened and i'm writing this to you and theopolis is a real person we don't quite know who he was but um if you guys want to do an interesting search, you can search that out. But he wrote, he said, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote to you about um, what, be what Jesus began to do and teach. Now check it out. This is like an add-on letter behind what Jesus began to do and teach. Um, Luke saw it as Jesus was here on earth. He did these things on earth. And then he went into heaven. And now he's doing these things on earth again um, through a different means. That's it. That's what he's writing here. And you guys, we got to understand that, that um, it's not like Jesus left and then he never came back to do anything with the earth again. He's still working. He's been working ever since, probably as, as much, if not more so, than he ever has. So you guys understand that. Um, we, we're so, it's so easy for us to go, oh, Jesus went through the grave, he left, and now we're just waiting for that second coming. Well, um, that second coming came the minute that you gave your life to him. Understand that that Jesus is actually working through his people. And we're gonna see that here. So um, it's really cool that he wrote that. That actually means that this is actually history that, that Luke is writing down. And I think he probably knew that. I, I think he probably knew that there, he was bearing witness to something and he better get it down on paper. I don't know that he knew how long it would be read, but he did know that he had to get it down on paper. Um, and it was written by a real person to a real person. It's amazing. That's and and then it's been used by the Holy Spirit ever since for thousands of years. It's it's amazing. It makes you makes your work for God what what you think is kind of menial. Oh, I got to write this devotional, or I got to do this, or I got to do that. Makes your work um, stand out a little bit more. Uh, second thing, verse two. Until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit that the apostles had chosen, that, that to the apostles that he had chosen. Um, now, it was real events. Notice the Holy Spirit is what had to come before they would have knowledge or, or, or any kind of insight or meaning to what was going on here. They had to rely on the Holy Spirit for reality. Nothing's changed, by the way. They had to rely on the Holy Spirit for reality. Nothing's changed. Verse three. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Uh, um, now check this part out. This is the part that's really, really fun when you start thinking about uh, the character of Jesus, our Lord, how he is. Um, he didn't, you know, it would have been one thing if he just came through the grave and then left and didn't come back and tell us about what that meant. But that's not what he did. He stuck around for 40 days after that and preached about what that significance of all that was um he did it now check it out he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of god that's awesome um and he's and quite honestly that's how we get the the epistles that's how we get um a lot of the theology that we got is he came back and he says okay so i went through um all of this the my earthly ministry the cross the grave and this is what it means and, and then he put an exclamation point on the whole Testament by doing that. He says, this is how, this is what all this means, you guys. This is reality, in other words. And he's still doing that now. He's actually doing it right now. Um, 
as I was doing, going through the study, he was doing that in my mind. It's a continual building of reality that how the Holy Spirit works within the things that are even going on around you right now through history and then looking into the future. So it's an amazing thing when you start thinking about this. He came for 40 days um, and, and then it says he presented himself right the road to um, Emmaus and through the, Peter, you know, and through Mary first at the grave. He was showing himself to these guys through Thomas. He's like, hey, Thomas, look, I have the scars to prove it, man. Through all this stuff. Um, now think about that. If you were God, would you do that? I mean, we have a hard enough time as a mechanic. Uh, I was a mechanic for a lot of years. I ran. I was the foreman of a shop for quite a few years, and I would ha I would show something to somebody three or four times, and if they didn't get it by then, I'm like, man, they're just never going to get this. Um, maybe we should start thinking about putting them in a different position or something like that. Um, that's not how Jesus thinks. <laughs> he came back <laughs> and told us, "Hey, look, you guys." Don't you get it yet? This is what what was going on. Um, so it's hard for us to understand how patient and how this 40 days, how big of a deal that is. It's God um, who, who has every authority in the world to say, you should have got this. But yet he doesn't do it. He's still, for thousands of years later, he's still telling people, look, take take what I've, what I've left you and start thinking about it. Um, Reality is, it's it's real. Start looking at that. Um, can I challenge you guys to do that? Can I challenge you guys to actually start looking at it that way? Go, you know, God, this is a gift. This isn't something that we deserve. We don't deserve God telling us um, his plans and what he does. We don't deserve that at all. It's a gift that he does that. And then he, he goes, I give you enough that you can now believe me in these things. So the stuff that you don't know, you can believe me in that too. And that's, what, that's how faith works, you guys. Um, we know enough about who God is through the stuff that he's shown us that we can believe him through the stuff that, he ha that we just have to trust him in, um, which is actually a great thing in the world that we live in now or in the world that's always been. It's been that way since uh, the forbidden fruit has been eaten. So think that through. That's great comfort, right? I mean, you understand that God is that person who... Um, treats us like that, that means that he's not like us in the way that we treat each other. Um, that's great news. That's great news. Because a lot of times we look at God and we think, oh, he's treating um, uh, people like we would treat him. No, he's, he's infinitely better than that. So, great news. Um, now, check, it, check this out. So, he did all these things. He appeared to a lot of people, but I'm going to point out one of them, and it's in 1 Corinthians 15.3. And I'll read it to you. It's 15, 3 uh, through 8 if you guys want to follow along. For what I, this is Paul talking. And he's talking to the Corinthians and he's saying, hey, look, um, trust what you've been taught because of what you've seen through what Christ has done. So trust what you've been taught. Even though you don't know it, trust it. And this is what he says. He says, for what I've received, I pass to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and to the twelve. After that he appeared to, now check this out. After This is after the grave. After that uh, he appeared to 500 of the brothers and sisters at the time of uh, when most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. So he's saying, Paul is saying, hey look. Um, this is actually a lot of the people that were there, these 500 are still alive. You can go talk to them right now. That's what Paul's saying, which means that this gospel, this is a side note, by the way, which means that the gospel that Paul talked about here, um, isn't that far apart away from what Jesus was saying while he was on earth. Now catch that. What I'm saying is, is if the people that sat there and watched the Ascension, 500 of them were still alive when this, um, document was written, then we know that that's what Jesus said about the gospel. You guys catch that? So when people come and tell you, hey, how can you trust that ancient literature? It's changed over the years. You know, Constantine got a hold of it in 325 AD and he changed it all. Come on. Paul says that's not the way it is. This is, this is what it is. And 500 people testify to that. 
Okay. That's a big deal. And, and then it says, then he appeared to James and the apostles, and, and um, at last he appeared to me. And he said, the un, an abnormally born one, the one that um, wasn't part of the original apostles, is what he's saying. So, um, pretty crazy when you start thinking about it, that uh, Jesus appeared for 40 days and did that. And then, um, what's even more amazing, that we have 1 Corinthians that um, is dated back to the people that act, that saw, not that the other Gospels aren't, but um, they didn't write it in there like Paul did. That Well, Luke did. He said, look, this is what I saw. But Paul's saying, hey, test it with 500 people. Go talk to them. That's that's awesome. I mean, for me, that's just like, thanks, thanks, thank you, Lord, for putting that in there because, you know, I'm a natural born skeptic, but when somebody says, hey, go test it for yourself, and then there's not a bunch of like self-help books about the 500 people that went and tested this out, and they're like, oh, well, that didn't work out. No, it's it, they, people did go and test it. And matter of fact, when I was doing the research on this, um, other historians that were outside of the way or the Christians um, talked about it as well. <laughs> and they said, we don't know what happened, but he was gone. And uh, he, he I mean, he died and, and he walked on earth, but I don't know what happened after that. All right, so verse 4. Um, now, this, this is pretty cool. Jesus came back, and after, after he'd gone through the cross and after he'd gone through all that, one of the ways that he, um, that he ministered to people was we, with eating, eating with them. That's pretty dang cool. You know why? For one, uh, resurrected bodies, we get to eat, so... We will get our Carl's Jr. But uh, another thing is, is um, the fact that he, that that's who Jesus is. Is he's so he, he's so um, genuinely real. I mean, if we were Jesus, a lot of times we'd wear a crown and and we'd be like, peasants, you're not going to eat with me. But that's not who Jesus is. He doesn't do that. He doesn't make these hierarchies of of like peasant. Although we should treat him like we are peasants because we are. See, that's the difference is he's, he's so much, he's so good and so kingly and, and so amazing and all those things that it naturally brings it out of people who have the Holy Spirit in them to go, oh my goodness, that king of mine is all those things. I want to I, I bow as hard as I can bow to him, but yet he loves me so much that he, oh, it's just, you guys... I can't even explain it. It's so glorious that I can't even explain it. it. It's something that when you start realizing how good our king is, that's when you start understanding what faith is. And, and then that's when you start going, man, I want to be like him. I, I want to do what he says. I want to be a Christian. All right. Um, verse 5. Now check this out. Verse 5, he says, um, John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And notice that they they hadn't got the Holy Spirit yet and they didn't have knowledge and they didn't know meaning yet. Um, we'll look at what happened once that happened down the line. We're gonna, we'll study that later in, in weeks to come. But understand that um, it, even at this time, they still didn't understand it. And I'll, and I'll prove that to you. And they gathered, because they gathered around him at the table, they were gathering around him and they said, Lord, is this the time that you're gonna restore the kingdom of Israel? Or the kingdom to Israel is what it actually says. Think that through. They still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. They still thought that he was the Messiah that was going to save them from the Romans. And it was going to be like they elected him to be their president. And he's all powerful because he's their president. Not because he's the king of the universe and he destroyed death. He destroyed it and threw it away. It's not because of that. You see, they still didn't get it. And that's why he says, um, you have to have the Holy Spirit to start understanding this stuff. And friend... If you're watching this and you are not of Christ and you're like, I don't understand anything of that. Um, take what you do know about God and then start believing on that. And then come to him through the scripture and say, okay, um, I know that I'm not just an evolved naked ape. So there's got to be something more. Lord, please show me yourself. And I guarantee you, he will. He will, he will show you who he is. Um, just start going out and looking at the clouds, looking at the buds on these trees and start understanding that the Lord is so much infinitely more um, that we can't just we can't just blow it off as being nature is cool and this and that 
there's something at work here. There is an intelligent mind that designed all this. That there's, there's mind that created matter. There's not matter that creates mind. It doesn't work that way. Understand that, and you know that. In, intuitively, you know it. Um, you can make all the excuses in the world, but you still know that, that there has to be a mind that created matter. Um, if you do that, and, and you say, I want your Holy Spirit because I want to know more about you. I want your knowledge to live within me and to root out all of my, um, all of my wrong thoughts about you. You will start to understand things. That's exactly what he's talking about here. He says, look, um, he, sa he said, it's not for you. It's not your time, but you will receive power of the Holy Spirit. That power is going to give you knowledge. It's going to give you meaning of what comes. Uh, verse 8, uh, you'll see power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you will, And then once you get this power, you're going you're gonna to do something with it. You're going to be my witnesses. So he, he kind of even just obliterates uh, the disciples' question, right? He's like, you guys still don't get it, but you're going to. And, it's, and when you do, you're going to witness to it. You're going to spread this word. Um, so much so that even death itself is not going to stop you. Um, even when YouTube, uh, when YouTube wants to censor what you're saying, or even when uh, Facebook tries to get you to where people don't see it, you, Facebook and YouTube can't stop it. Um, even death's not going to stop it. Matter of fact, all of the disciples um, went out and spread the gospel, and if it wasn't for them being beaten, they would probably wouldn't spread near as far. And he says, look, this thing is going to be so powerful in you that you're going to witness to Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. And it's still going on. Um, that's, that's still going on to this day. So he's saying, look, this Holy Spirit's going to come. That's the source of life itself. And life always bears witness. Catch that. The minute that something that is dead comes alive, you know, it says until Jesus puts his Holy Spirit into us, that our, heart, our hearts are like hardened stone, and then he's going to make us hearts of flesh. He's going to give us life again. And that's what, that's what it is. It's, it's life coming back into it. And that life always, life always bears witness. Um, I was going through the woods, and, and there's these big rocks. Uh, up in, you go up in, in the wilderness up here in Sky Lakes, there's huge rock outcroppings. And one rock uh, caught my attention. There's this little tree growing out of the middle of this rock. I mean, and it's not like the rock was cracked and it was down in dirt. There was enough dirt in like this little hole in the tree, or in the, in the rock, and this life was growing out of it. And I looked at that rock and I was thinking, man, that rock stands out. There's something significant about it, and that's because there was life growing out of it. Life will always bear witness. Um, life in our spirits, where there was once a rock, is going to bear witness to everybody else around us. And after he said this, he was taken up right before him, right before their eyes. Boom! He just says this. Life's going to bear witness. Boom! There it goes. Could you imagine? <laughs> and, and the disciples are still going, okay. And you know, they were pretty fearful of things. Um, here, here they thought Jesus was coming back, walking among them, and then all of a sudden he's gone again? Oh, man. That, that had to have been pretty hard. But they did do one thing. They believed him. And they stayed in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit did come. And we're going to see that later. I really want to, man, I would love to share that with you, but we don't have two hours. Uh, we'll do that later. Um, and then verse 10, they were looking intently in the sky. Then all of a sudden, these guys in white just boom, boom, pop next to them and say, hey, what the heck are you guys thinking? And so it shows that the, the, it shows that the disciples really didn't know. They really didn't know what was going on anyhow. Um, and they said, hey, look, the same Jesus that went up, he's coming back again. Um, pretty, pretty crazy things. Um, there's three things that I like to point out, and then I'll, then I'll close. Um, the first thing is, is the grave isn't the destiny of those who are attached to Jesus. The grave is not the destiny of those that are attached to Jesus. He showed them that in 40 days. The second thing, the power and knowledge of meaning comes from that attachment. Right? He's given them the Spirit. And the third thing, life is attached to Jesus because He is life. Life is attached to Jesus because He is life. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Uh, 
The grave isn't the destiny of those that are attached to Jesus. We're not destined to be just dirt. We're not just matter. We're not animated molecules that are just made up of dirt. There was actual, there was actual dirt and what else was blown into it was life. God's life, right? Remember in the Garden of Eden, he picked up a handful of dirt, formed a man out of it, and then he took and <sighs> breathed life into it. Humanity, humans, are not just matter. The, the scheme of the devil is to tell you that all you are is worm dirt that's living here for 80 short years, and then you're going to return to worm dirt, and none of it matters. But that is not true. And you intuitively know it's not true. You are part of that breath of life that God gave you. The Holy Spirit is renewing that in people. So to become a true human, that's, you have to have the Holy Spirit renewing that inside of you. And that's, that's, what you're, you, that's the race that God's creating, and that's what he's doing now. Um, second thing, the power of this knowledge and meaning comes from the attachment to this. Um, Notice when the Holy Spirit comes, that's when life comes. And that's when you start l looking um, uh, more at the things around you and, and you start understanding that this is not all there is. Could you, isn't it a great comfort to understand that COVID is not all there is? That um, murder is not all there is? That wars are not all they are? That the famines and the floods and, and isn't it great to understand that that stuff is speaking to something different that that stuff actually is saying look you need to know what life is really about you need to know about why the buds in the spring pop out you need to know about why the um the seeds that you plant in the ground spring up and then bring forth more fruit um See, that's where the knowledge and power come from because those are all, it's all a metaphor of what's really going on um, in the spiritual world. That we are actually living beings that are in, we are, we are spirits living in a body, not a body that contains a spirit um, or a body that contains nothing, that's just matter, that um, just, just thinks. The fact that you actually test your thoughts shows that you are a spiritual being that is in tune with having a, sp a spiritual and a physical body. Think that through. Have you ever argued with yourself? Have you ever, have you ever had a conversation about whether you were thinking the right thought or not? That is not just molecules. There's something spiritual inside that. And see, that's what the Lord's saying is... I will fix that part of you until you until you come to God until you actually start living in reality you act that part of you actually is dead it actually does not even think straight it, it, it makes um, wrong decisions all the time it actually is rebellious against reality it's rebellious against God so he's saying hey look I this is what I'm doing the Holy Spirit's gonna bring power and meaning and knowledge and light and life um, um, and it's going to put that inside and that part of you that makes your the way that you think, the way that you act, the way that you feel, the way that you love. It's going to put that in the right category where you're going to do that in the right way. That's what power and knowledge is. That's what the Holy Spirit is. That's what God's done. That's what the, that's what the grave did. And that's what the ascension means. And the last thing, life is attached, is attached to Jesus because he is life. So he is, the, he is the one that brought life. Um, let's take a look. One last passage here. We'll take a look in, in um, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. And we're going to look at the first, the very first book of the Gospel of John. And we're going to see um, how this life actually entered the world. And now it's being shared with the world. Um, and it can be shared with you right now by the way. If you, if you have not met life yet, uh, you need to. And I'm not talking about being birthed. I'm talking about being rebirthed. If you, if you haven't got your spirit fixed to where it starts thinking God's thoughts, you need that life. That's what you need inside of you. That is the only thing that really um, has any truth to it. So let me read this to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now understand that the Word is the direct representation of God in the flesh, okay? So that's Jesus himself. 
The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. So, through Him all things were made. So He's the one that made everything in Eden. And without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him, now check this out. This is what I wanted to point out. In Him was life. And that life was the light of ma all mankind. You guys, when we're looking at the stuff around us, when we see COVID and the, the death and the things that are going on around us and we sit here and we fear that stuff, um, some of the fear comes from because of the fact that you do not know where life comes from. Um, so if you're not a Christian, life only comes through Jesus Christ and you need to, you need to come to him and you need to, you need to really take serious what he says about life, that I am the one who created life, I'm the one who obtains life, and life just flows from me, and you gotta be attached to me to get life. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you haven't given your life to Christ, you could do that right now. You, you don't need me to sprinkle you with holy water or anything else, you just need to come to him, and you need to say, I believe you're there, Lord. I want life, and I, I, don't, I don't want just this life that's um, you know gonna be uh, worm dirt. I want true life because I know that I'm meant for that. Now if you are a Christian and all the stuff that's going on around you is really fearful, and it is, you guys, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's scary. It really is. But can I suggest that maybe you take your eye off of that stuff and you start putting it on Jesus and understand that He is at the head of everything and that you serve somebody who is the head of life, who life exists from, who life flows from, that his throne that he sits on in heaven actually springs life forward that you're a part of. Because when you do that, then you're gonna see all the rest of the stuff in a different light. All right, uh, hopefully that, guys, that gives you a little bit of insight. Um, we're gonna go through the rest of the book of Acts uh, in weeks to come. Hopefully we do it in the high school room, but until then, we'll keep doing it like this. Um, remember, get your permission slips in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for life. Thank you for what you've put into us. And Lord, please let me lean into that. Let me personally lean into the life that you have struck inside of me. Let me recognize that and recognize the power and the knowledge and the meaning of that. And let me not look at the stuff that's going on around me that is all temporary and has very, very many lies in it. Lord, let me look, put my eyes on you and trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys.